Topics 3.4, 3.5, 3.6 all revolve around gases. So I combine them together for these gas notes here. Now on the, this very front slide of the presentation, obviously the cute jack-o'-lantern with the dry ice, which is subliming into CO2 gas, which gives that, that nice cloudy feature around Halloween time, showing in that particular picture. This particular picture showing you one of the setups where you're collecting gas over water. And this is gonna be one of the main labs that we go over for this particular section on gases. This technique where you have a reaction in some sort of reaction vessel and then it comes up here and then the gas uh, basically is in this inverted measuring container. Sometimes it's a upside down graduated cylinder. It could be an upside, upside down burette. It's, we call it udiotomers. We use those as well, where they're basically, they look like a burette, but they don't have the spout at the end. And it collects the volume of the gas in there. And then as you can see, it's collecting it over water. Okay. So within the chamber here, you have some gas particles and some water particles floating around here. So we do have to take into account, especially for the pressure, the extra water molecules in there. We'll go over those calculations and we're going to collect data and do a virtual type lab where we watch videos over this um, and be able to, to get our data and collect that there. But that's going to be something we start maybe Friday or maybe Tuesday next week. Now the topics, the individual topics, 3.4 is called the ideal gas law topic and that's really involving all those different properties, the pressure, the temperature, the moles and the volume and all that stuff. Be looking at uh, calculations with those. The kinetic molecular theory are, is basically more of explaining the different uh, you know, properties and postulates of how gases behave. And then of course, gases deviate from the ideal gas law in terms of what we think should be how they're behaving at certain under certain conditions like high temperature, no, low temperatures and high pressures and things like that where gases have a tendency to not behave as they normally would. So we're gonna be looking at all three in this particular PowerPoint. Now we're not gonna get through all of it today, but we are gonna start. The enduring understanding of all of these topics, of course, gas properties are explained macroscopically using relationships among pressure, volume, temperature, moles, and gas constant, and molecularly by the motion of the gas. So we'll be looking at those different properties once again as we go through the different topics. Burning targets, I can explain the relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and moles of gases. Explain the relationships between the properties of a sample of gas or gas mixture using the ideal gas law and Dalton's law of partial pressure. So we'll get into Dalton's law as well, you know, and some mole fraction and partial pressures using Dalton's law. We're going to calculate quantities using gas laws. Lots of calculating. We're going to explain the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. Read and interpret graphical representations of gas data, including the Maxwell-Boltzmann's distribution. This is one particular graph that they expect you to be able to read carefully. And of course, we'll talk about conditions and identify gases, of course, based off of their non-ideal behavior. We'll be comparing things that would deviate from the ideal gas law. Now, pressure. Let's just define pressure in terms of like the physics definition. The amount of force applied to an area, like P equals F over A. Now, we're not going to use this and do any calculating with pressure in terms of this, but understanding the basic idea of what pressure is, is, is amounting to here. Force applied to an area. Atmospheric pressure is important because we use atmospheric pressure um, in certain different conditions. We refer to something called standard pressure all the time, which would be the atmospheric pressure at sea level. That's one of our uh, key measurements that we use quite often in our gas law calculations. But knowing that the atmospheric pressure is the weight of the air over the given unit of area. Now we're close to 
sea level in Northern Virginia, so we pretty much are close to standard pressure. If you were in, you know, Colorado up at, you know, 12,000 feet or something like that, the atmospheric pressure would be less. I don't know if you would feel it on your skin or not, but uh, we wouldn't know any different um, until we were subjected to, a, to pressure that's a lot less than what we're used to. Now, for in terms of gas law, what are we really going to talk about when we talk about pressure? We're going to be referring to the fact that the pressure of the gas is a measure of the number of collisions of the gas particles with the walls of the container. Because we're going to have the gases that are going to be injected into these vessels or these rigid containers. So we're really going to be concentrating on looking at it from pressure of the gas how many collisions with the walls of the container is occurring? If you have a lot, it's at a higher pressure. If you have less collisions with the walls of the container, it's at a lower pressure. So we're not really going to use the physics definition here, the physics calculations. We're going to focus on it from looking at it in terms of how it applies to chemistry. And in chemistry, we contain our gases in these vessels or our rigid containers. This is how they word it in the problems reaction vessel. They use these words that seem very, you know, highfalutin and all that, but that's what I want you to know. Number of collisions. That's what we're looking for here. More collisions means higher pressure. Less collisions means lower pressure. Now, the barometer is the device used to measure atmospheric pressure. Mercury, of course, Here's a typical barometer where you have mercury in here and the atmospheric pressure presses down and then it sends a certain amount of the mercury up the tube in the vacuum here. And this it would be at standard pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's standard pressure at sea level. And that's how it would be measured. We're not really going to be, you know, using barometers or doing anything much with them, but just that's where that value is marked from. And that's where this like 760 standard pressure has been measured from. Units of pressure. Now I put them this down here. I added this because this is what's on the formula sheet. So if we ever do get back to school um, and you're going to take your test in the classroom or whatever in the spring, depending upon, you know, how things go with, uh, you know, our getting back to school dates. Don't know if those will hold, but um, you would be allowed to use your formula sheet on the, the tests and the quizzes in the classroom and also on the AP exam. So the formula sheet, I know I loaded it at the beginning of the year. It's at the very bottom of classroom, like at the beginning of school stuff. You could pull it up and use it as a reference, or you can kind of make your own formula sheet as we go. But I did want to point this out to you that like these values, these are standard pressure values they are located on the formula sheet. Now, the standard pressure values we use on the formula sheet aren't necessarily the ones that are for the metric system, like the SI units, the system of international units, metric system. Newton per meter squared equals one Pascal. And then one standard atmosphere, which is one ATM, that equals uh, 101,325 pa Pascals. So we don't really use these, but I just wanted to point out to you that, you know, the metric system does have their own measurement. What we want to focus on is standard pressure values that we can use, 1 ATM, 760 millimeters of mercury and 760 TOR. And the TOR is um, the guy who invented or came up with the millimeters of mercury measurement. So that's why these values are the same. So it's either named after the guy or it's named after the amount of millimeters of mercury that go up. 101.3 kPa is sometimes used. That's this value over here, um, except for in this particular case, they're using the joule measurement of it, which we will use later. But it could also be 8.314 liters times kPa over moles times Kelvin. And that's what these little minus ones mean. In math, that means it goes on the bottom. It's a denominator. So um, you can make that note that this number actually is also the KPA number. If you're using that pressure in the ideal gas law, those would be the ones that you would want for the um, 
the gas constant r, but we'll go over the gas constants in more detail in just a minute. All right, pressure conversions. You need to be able to convert between any of them uh, based off the standard pressure ones, at least. That's what I'm saying. Like, for instance, you, here's uh, converting between ATMs and TOR. So if I have 2.5 ATMs, but the question wants it the pressure in TOR or millimeters of mercury, you would set up the T-chart. You know, this is like dimensional analysis here. And you would do your conversion and be able to convert over the pressure measurements. This is one showing a conversion between atmospheres and pascals. So you would also, once again, set up your dimensional analysis and be able to convert those no problem. So that should be pretty basic, doing basic conversions. You have to be able to do pressure conversions. And you could do it between the millimeters of mercury. You could do it with the KPA, the 101.3. KPA, because that equals one atmosphere as well, which equals 760 millimeters of mercury. You can use any of them. These are just a couple examples, but the expectation would be that you would know how to convert them. All right, let's start looking and observing some gas stuff. Liquid nitrogen in a balloon. A, B, C, the pictures going along here. Anybody want to give me an idea or have have you had any interaction or knowledge of liquid nitrogen? Or even just looking at the picture, what do you think about the liquid nitrogen? Any knowledge of liquid nitrogen and having ever worked with it? Yes, it definitely is making the balloon deflate. That's what it appears to be doing. Nitrogen is in the atmosphere. It's like 80% of our atmospheric gas. So if it's a liquid nitrogen, what does that mean in terms of its temperature? At normal conditions, it's a gas. Here I'm sitting around 80 of nitrogen just like you are. So if it's liquid nitrogen, it's much, much colder. It's a lot colder. So as you can see, as you're putting the balloon next to the very cold, dipping it into that liquid nitrogen, what's happening to the balloon? It is shriveling up. It's deflating. It is doing those things. So based off of that, that's the observation. We see the balloon is deflating. Now, what can we interpret or infer about the gas particles inside? Anybody have an idea? Any kind of inference? And there's different ones you can make here. It's getting colder. So what does that tell you about the gas particles themselves? How are they moving now? They're slowing down. So yes, if, if we left it in there for too long, you're, you're right, it would become a um, a liquid it would condense or maybe even become a solid but right now they're slowing down they're slowing down so are they hitting the walls of the container or the walls of the balloon as frequently not hitting the walls of the balloon as frequently so what's happening to the pressure it's decreasing good the pressure is decreasing which is part of the reason why it's deflating and what is happening to our volume here Particles are slowing down. They're not hitting as much. They could be into that con condensing stage where eventually it's going to yeah, turn into liquid and solid. So that volume is also decreasing here. Definitely uh, really, really impacting the movement of those particles and decreasing the volume and the pressure. So this is just one observation showing you uh, how gas particles can be affected. In this one, we're changing the temperature. Obviously, the letter A, the balloon is at a much higher temperature, but once you stick it in the liquid nitrogen, we are decreasing the temperature very quickly. All right, so what happened to the gas in the balloon? We decided that the decrease in temperature decreased the pressure in the volume of the gas, all right? So they both, uh, the pressure and volume went down 
due to this change in temperature. Now, these kind of observations led to the development of these gas laws, seeing these different things happen like such. So observations deflated, and then they start thinking about the gas particles and how they're behaving and interacting. Now, the math mathematical relationships, we're gonna be looking at these properties of gases and their mathematical relationships. So the properties we're gonna be looking at, pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. Those are the basic four here that we're really gonna be honing in on. And this is what makes up our gas laws. So those are the four properties that we're gonna be really working with here, especially in this particular part of the lecture. One thing we need to note that's very, very important is that temperature always needs to be changed to Kelvin. Must have it changed to Kelvin. So this is the formula. Don't pass go, don't collect $200 before you change your temperature to Kelvin here. Very important. Make sure you do that before you plug any temperatures into any of the gas law formulas or your answer will be incorrect. So always, always change it to Kelvin, add 273 to your Celsius to get K. Now they're on the same scale, so they're same increments. It's just the difference of starting at 273 uh, versus, so it's a difference of 273 between the two numbers. Whereas Fahrenheit is actually on a different incremental scale. It's like five ninths of something, totally different formula. Celsius and Kelvin are incrementally the same. They're just a difference of 273. Let's look at Boyle's Law. Pressure and volume are inversely related. What does inversely related mean again? If my pressure increases, what's going to happen to my volume? Yes, it's going to decrease. Very good. So Boyle's Law, these two variables are the ones that are changing, whereas temperature is constant and number of moles is constant. So those two remain constant, pressure and volume are the ones changing. Now mathematically, this is because the pressure volume, um, when you multiply them, they equal a proportionality constant. And this is something that they can put on a graph to show you. So that uh, it's a, it is an uh, inverse numerical value, mathematical value where these two um, variables are related. And here is our formula. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So pressure 1 times volume 1 gives you pressure 2 times volume 2. That's if you're changing the original conditions of the gas. So here's our original conditions. Here's our new conditions of our gas. Now the reason why talk about the proportionality constant is this is how it's graphed. You have your pressure on the X, your volume on the Y, and it shows this like decay curve relationship. But if you change the plot to where you're doing the volume uh, one over P, then you have this you know constant slope value, and that's why you get the straight line. So it is you know, an incremental change here between if you adjust the pressure, it's going to incrementally change the volume. This is just for the graphing and the mathematical, you know, minds out there to see. However, I will tell you, these type of graphs find their way into multiple choice questions, where it could be, you know, how are pressure and volume related for a gas then they could give you four different graphs to choose from, and you would want the one that shows as the pressure's increasing, the volume's decreasing. So you would want to show this particular and choose that particular graph for um, the answer. So don't have to know that it's Boyle's Law, like they're not going to ask you, is this Boyle's Law? They want to know if you know the relationship between pressure and volume. You can see it in the graph. You know that as the pressure goes up, the, the volume's decreasing, and it's at a constant rate value here, as shown on this particular graph where your you know, volume is equal to the, the proportionality constant times one over P here. 
So let's set up a gas law problem real quick. I want to show you the expectations of what I would like to see here in your problem sets and your free response type uh, responses. The kind of work that you need to make sure that you include. So here, a sample of helium gas occupies 12.4 liters at 23 degrees Celsius and 0.956 atmospheres. What volume will it occupy at 1.20 atm or atmospheres, assuming the temperature stays constant? So we're assuming temperature is constant. We're assuming the moles are constant because we're not adding more gas or taking away more gas. They didn't say anything about that, so we're going to assume that moles remain constant as well. That, that means I know it's just a pressure volume relationship, so I'm going to use P1V1 equals P2V2. So the first thing you should do for any kind of um, formula math is always write out the formula. Write out the formula before you substitute. That's important. That goes for any formulas in, in AP chemistry. You want to show that you're using the correct formula. Then you move on to the plug and chug. So the plug is figuring out and plugging in the, the numbers into their correct spots. So I would go here, a sample of helium gas occupies of this volume, so that's V1. Temperature is remaining the same, so I don't have to worry about that. This is the first pressure, 0.956 atms. What volume? This is V2, so that's what I'm missing at this pressure, P2, right here. So I plug in my numbers. This is the plug part. I'm gonna put that in, you know, definitely include your units. And then the volume here, 12.4 liters. 12.4 liters. This is gonna be the second uh, pressure, 1.20 atm. And V2 here, like so. Now, this is the, the plug-in. I just plugged in my numbers, substituted them in. Then you get your answer. So that's the, the chug part, plug and chug. Plug in your numbers, they get your answer. There you go. Now, you don't have to show me the algebra here. You do not have to show me the division or anything like that. You just need to show me the formula, the substitution, and then your calculated answer. 0.956 times 12.4, use your calculator, and then divide by 1.2 here. So that's the basic algebra that we're going to see here. Now, everything up here has three significant figures. So I'm going to keep three in my answer, 9.88 liters. And that would be the correct answer. Now, another way to know to kind of mentally check your numbers I know that if the pressure is going up, the volume is going to decrease. So the pressure is definitely going up here, going from 0.956 to 1.2. Pressure is increasing. That means my volume should decrease. And I can check it here. 12.4 was my original volume. Did it decrease? Yes, it did. So my, my answer is probably correct. If this number was bigger, then I know I did something wrong. And so, so do use some of your number sense here. You know the relationship between the variables. You should be able to kind of mentally check your numbers. Make sure you're getting them correct. So that is what I want to see for the setup when you're doing these gas law problems or any formula problems in AP chemistry. So you can get all of the credit needed, you know, for uh, get the entire point there. All right, Charles Law. This is the volume temperature law. Now in Kelvin, of course, because we're going to talk about that in detail in just a second. They're directly related. Let's talk about directly related. If volume goes up, what's going to happen to the temperature? It also should go up. Temperature should increase. Very good. Now, of course, pressure is constant. Moles are constant. Now, N, of course, is a value or variable letter that we use for moles. So. N is energy level and N is also moles. In gas laws, N is, is moles in electron configurations and looking at atomic structure, N equals, that's we're talking about principal energy levels. So no, um, when we're looking at gas laws, you see N is referring to, to moles. Now, of course, 
the volume equals a proportionality constant times the temperature because they are incrementally going to increase at the same amount. Don't forget to change everything to Kelvin. And the reason why we use the Kelvin scale, just to go a little bit further on this, is because 0K is absolute zero. There are no negative values on the Kelvin scale. So you won't get any negative pressures, you won't get any negative volumes or anything like that when you are using Kelvin values in the problem. So if we used Celsius values in there, we would have some negatives. And then of course, then we would result in having negative pressures and volumes, which we don't want because those are that's not possible. You can't have a negative volume. You can't have a negative pressure. So the reason why we use the Kelvin scale, we change everything to Kelvin, is because our very bottom of it is absolute zero. Zero K is where all particles stop moving and have no kinetic energy at all. And that would be the very bottom of the scale. There are no negative numbers. Now they've gotten really close to it in the lab. They haven't actually attained complete absolute zero, but slowing particles down, reducing friction, reducing stuff like that, very um, applicable in the scientific world. The formula here is set up in fraction form. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now I don't like working with fractions, so I cross them up. I always start with my formula like this. V1 T2 equals V2 T1. And you're welcome to do that if you don't like working it uh, from a fraction format. Either way, the setup is fine. You just need to write out the formula first, then plug in your numbers, and then get your answer. The graph, here you're looking at temperature versus volume. Once again, that you might see one of these in a multiple choice question. I've seen them in many example questions. Uh, in this case, it would be temperature volume. You would want to see the direct increasing straight line. Okay, and that's where that proportionality constant, that's kind of like the slope of the line there. All right, exercise two. Suppose a balloon containing 1.3 liters of air at 24 degree, 24.7 degrees Celsius is placed in a beaker containing liquid nitrogen negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. What will the volume of the sample be? Uh, volume of the sample of air become at constant pressure. Since again, it's not really talking about adding or subtracting moles, so we're going to assume the moles are also constant here. Now, before I begin. What should I do here? Any suggestions? Write the formula. I like that. We could do that. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Good idea. So I'm going to go ahead and write out my formula where I cross them up because that's how I like to do it. I do it that way. But you can use this version of the formula too. Now what else can I do here? What's the next thing I should do? Ah, convert to Kelvin, I like that idea. Okay, so I'm gonna take this one, okay, 273 plus 24.7. I think that gives you 297.7K. Converting this one here, so add 273 and Negative 78.5 plus 273 gives me 194.5K. Good. Don't forget to co convert to Kelvin. Very good. Now I'm going to label my variables. That's what I do. You don't have to, but this is what I do. Suppose a balloon containing this volume, V1, this temperature, T1, Place in a beaker containing liquid. This is temperature two, so I'm looking for volume two. That's the one I'm missing. I like to label my variables, so then I know where to plug them in. So this volume is related to this temperature. So it doesn't matter really if you make them V1, T1, or V2, T2. They just have to match together in order to do it right. But this is the original volume and the original temperature, and then I'm changing the temperature. So those are the new conditions. So I'm going to keep them as the ones. So I put this in here, 1.3 liters, 
times my T2, which is my other temperature over here, 194.5K. And then V2 is what I'm missing, so I'm going to keep that the variable and then put in my T1 over here. Then I can just calculate and get my V2. Multiply these two, divide by the 297.7. Now, since the temperature is decreasing, what should happen to my volume as well? What should happen to my 1.3 number? It should decrease. So when I calculated, it better be lower or I know I did something wrong. And it does happen to be lower, which is nice. And now, okay, for significant figures, it's going to seem a little odd. We have three for our volume. But when we add in our 273, that actually creates four significant figures for both of my um, temperatures. Doesn't really affect the answer, though, because we still go, since we're multiplying and dividing, we're going to go with the least number. And the least number right here happens to be three significant figures. So I'm going to keep three in my answer. So when you add in the 273, it does add that extra digit in. So you would consider that, you know, significant value. All right, so here we go. I got 0.849 liters. Gay-Lussac's law. This is when volume and moles are constant. Pressure and temperature are directly proportional. Now it's going to start to feel like a broken record here. So as pressure increases, temperature increases. They are also related proportionally by a constant, as you know. And here's the formula, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And once again, you just have to know that pressure and temperature, you know, pressure increases, pressure goes up, temperature is going to go up as well. They're directly related. Now, I always write this formula like this, P1, T2, P2, T1, but you can use it however. And Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, Gay-Lussac's, and Avogadro's Law. Once again, it's nice if you know which one belongs with which person, but they're not going to ask you the names of the people. Just, just going to say that right here. You just need to know which variable, how it is directly or indirectly related to other variables. Avogadro's law is the volume mole one where temperature and pressure are constant, okay? So same idea here as the moles increase, the volume should increase if these two other factors are being held constant. So once again, related by the proportionality constant, and it also gives you an increasing straight line on the graph, moles versus the volume. Okay, as it did for pressure and temperature with Gay-Lussac's law, same thing here. You could write it as N1V2 equals N2V1, just by crossing them up. One thing, though, I'd like to point out about this nice graphic here, where it's showing the volumes all the same for helium gas, nitrogen gas, and methane gas. 22.4 liters, one atmosphere, zero degrees Celsius. This is standard temperature pressure. So it equals Avogadro's number, which equals one mole of any substance. So all of these containers have one mole of gas in them because they all have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in them. Um, and they're all at the same temperature and pressure. One thing to note about the gases, though, are different is their masses. Obviously, helium is lighter than nitrogen. Nitrogen is a little bit heavier than methane. Methane 16 grams uh, per mole. Now, what we're going to see here later on, too, the other values that would be different about these gases, you know, is the densities. The mass per unit volume is different. But the number of moles, the temperature, the pressure, and the volume are all the same if we're relating these particular variables together. The masses would be the thing that would be different and therefore the densities as well. All right, let's do exercise three. This very simple. Um, this is a, I can recognize this as Avogadro's law because we have moles and volume. What volume will be with new moles? and temperature and pressure are constant. 
So I know that this is going to be a um, Avogadro's one, like so. So this is going to be N1. This is going to be V1. Those two are the related ones. What will be the new volume? Here's new conditions. Uh, this is not a V. This is going to be an N2. So as you can see, the moles are decreasing. What should happen to the volume then once we calculate it? What should happen to the volume since we're starting out with more moles and we're, we're decreasing the moles? The volume should decrease as well. Good. The first volume was 89 liters. So set up your formula, plug and chug. Okay, the moles cancel with the moles and we're left with liters here. Everything has uh, three significant figures, so that's what I'm going to keep in my answer. And I'm getting 76.3 liters as my answer. So easy enough. Now these are very basic type math problems that you're going to see here. Now before we continue and we get real in depth into the ideal gas law, I want to show you a simulation where it shows how the different variables are interacting now. Really pay attention to the how the particles are changing, how they're moving with the different variables, the pressure, volume, temperature, moles changing. All right, so definitely take a look at that.